Angel is brought to you by NetSuite from Oracle. The only system you need to run your business. Go to netsuite.com slash angel to get your free guide called Crushing the Five Barriers to Growth. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Angel, the podcast. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm at Jason or Instagram, Jason. And you can follow me uh, on Amazon. Buy the book, Angel. Go ahead and search for it. You can see it right here if you're watching the video. We do this podcast uh, 10 times. We're in our second season. And this is a podcast for people interested in angel investing and early stage investing in startups, specifically here in the Bay Area, but also abroad. And it's not about because a lot of confusion uh, has come up recently with people saying, oh, angel investing, what about movies? What about pizzerias? What about dry cleaners? That's a different thing. Those are called donations. <laughs> you, you will not get your money back if you angel invest in a movie or a book or whatever. Those are, just consider those donations. What we're talking about here is doing this for a living and having a return, hopefully a return that beats the uh, stock market, right? So if you're going to take the time to invest in private companies that are illiquid, you would hope that the return would be greater than being in liquid shares in Netflix or Facebook or Google, or whatever you want to invest in, in the stock market. There are many different ways to get into early stage investing. Sometimes people get their MBA and they go directly into um, banking or into venture capital because they know somebody from their fraternity or sor sorority who is doing it already. Other people say the best way to do it is to come out of a startup or working in operations in a big company. Our guest today um, comes to it both from being at a large company, Yahoo, where mm -hmm. you manage growth, and also um, working at startups and being CEO of a company. So welcome to the program, Arjun Sethi. Thanks for having me. Um, great to have you here. You work at a social capital partnership now. and uh, But before that, just to give people a general background, what did you do before you became an investor? Uh, uh Post-college? Yeah, we don't have to go through like the, I mean, if there's a great story from high school, childhood where you like, you no, know, there's no great. did some amazing uh, startup business. But it's actually interesting when you're a founder, almost every founder has an adolescent entrepreneur story. Do you have one where you did something entrepreneurial in your youth? I didn't. I, uh, Tell me. I, I quit high school. Uh, quit high school? I quit high school. Oh, what did mom yeah. and dad say about that? They were not very happy. How do you have that conversation with your parents? Hey, mom and dad, I'm quitting high school. What did they do? Yeah, well, my uh, I grew up here, so my dad wow. um, was an entrepreneur as well, and so I kind of watched him build his company. What did he build? Um, so he was in like the networking stack, gigabit switch in the, oh, wow. in the mid to late 90s. Like the Cisco world or Correct. stuff like that. Yeah, So Got and it. also on the security side. So I watched him build his companies, um, very successful, and I said, I could I could do these same things this yeah. before I went to college. And so what I decided to do is uh, I was into cars and aftermarket parts. Huh. Uh, I dropped out of high school. Dropped out is probably a good way of saying it. I think I was, I was also kicked out at the same time. Yeah. So it was, it was a good way to say, like, no, I don't want to be there. It didn't work out. Yeah. Um, and so some friends and I, we started building aftermarket parts. A lot of it was just like manual welding and creating the wow. parts herself. And then eventually over time, we started manufacturing it. Wow. Not huge scale, but it was a company. Is this for like what, like drifting cars or like some specific type of car? Yeah, so we specifically built turbocharger applications for cars oh. that were not naturally, that had a turbocharger. This is when them. people change the chip to turbocharge the engine uh, or you, physical hardware to do it? A chip would be a part of it, but oh. we used to build these kits. Oh. Uh, so it was multiplicative. And then it would, would it cost a couple grand to make your car go faster? Uh, yeah, thirty five hundred bucks is kind of the sweet spot. Nice. My first business, I think this is my first business, was Jason's Hot Tapes. My dad won a copy of The Empire Strikes Back. He was playing backgammon with a guy. The guy got into my dad for a couple of G's. The guy said, "I don't even have the vig. I can't pay you the interest, but mm -hmm. um, I got something. I know your kids love the Star Wars. We uh, we recorded The Empire Strikes Back when it was in the uh, theater uh, up in Bensonhurst." Mm -hmm. They gave my dad a copy of The Empire Strikes Back that they had recorded. Mm -hmm. They put like three video cameras in the back of the room. This is in the early 80s. My dad was like, all right, that's fine. He gave it to me. Then I figured out you could copy it. So I copied it. And then I sold copies of The Empire Strikes Back, which was not a high quality copy, but it wasn't available yeah. for 20 bucks. I sold about 30 or 40 of them. Sorry, George Lucas. I owe you a thousand dollars. Royalties. Royalties. Yeah. But it's almost, and my dad was a bartender who had a bar. It, entrepreneurial dads build and moms build entrepreneurial kids and in general. 
It's possible. I, I think although my sisters didn't go that route, and, um, they went the more traditional route. Mm. Um, and I also decided I wanted to go the more traditional route, and I right. didn't like the whole startup scene, all these companies, crazy ideas. Most of them don't work. Um, my dad was also angel investing. He had his own venture fund during that time frame. Wow. And so I just watched a ton of failure. So I, I, I went to the East Coast for school, and I decided I was never going to come back. Huh. Uh, but I came back. It's fascinating because I always make the joke that nobody is born or almost nobody I've met here is born into this, mm -hmm. except for Tim Draper's kids, mm -hmm. who are, by the way, and Ron Conway's, mm -hmm. who those, they're incredible investors, hardworking, mm -hmm. um, and have done really well for themselves. Um, but you actually were born into this. I was, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, okay, so you launched, a, you worked at Yahoo for a while doing growth. Was that, did you sell them a company and then you went to work for them? Yeah, so my company messaged me, which yeah. we started about four and a half years ago. Uh, we sold that to Yahoo, um, and it was. Then we ran the growth and data science team there, so mm. we started that team uh, wow. and then continued to expand it on the marketing side. And then we also ran what we call the mobile and emerging products teams. When you were at Yahoo, did you ever have the sense that it was possible to right the ship? In other words, when a when a giant company is past their paradigm, mm -hmm. display advertising in this case, sure, does it feel like you're just gliding it in for a landing but there's no way to get it back up to altitude yeah so i have a lot of thoughts on this yeah and i've written about this a lot i think to um to change the momentum of any if you want to take like the analogy of a boat right, right. Like it's huge and you have to like move in different directions especially when it has a certain type of momentum and the wind is carrying it yeah um it's just really hard to move mm. uh, and in order to do it you kind of have to just stop figure out where you want to go and then start, and it, and it means you kind of have to start from scratch almost. Right. That means you have to cut a lot of heavyweight um, out, and I think uh, Marissa and a lot of the team were just not willing to do that, and they they might have done a slow bleed for some areas, yeah. which eventually was the same outcome, but the amount of time that passed was just so long that you kill morale, you kill momentum, and you kill your ability to figure out what you want to do next. And this was apparent to everybody going in. In fact, Mark Andreessen said, whoever wants to be the next CEO of mm -hmm. Yahoo famously, if they just cut half the employees, it'll be a great business again and they'll be really strong footing. But Marissa couldn't do that. Yeah. Great, great business allows you time, uh, builds you a certain amount of moat for the, uh, for the short term to figure out what decisions you want to make moving forward. Right. Um, she didn't want to do that. And I think a lot of people internally didn't want to do that. And that could have been also a leftover of uh, the media style attitude of the people that were there during that time frame. Yeah. I also thought singular focus is so important in a business, as we all know. And I was like, if it was me, I'd focus on video because that seems to be the closest to the DNA. Mm -hmm. But could be mobile, could be social, but they have no social DNA. They have, I, I guess they bought some mobile companies, so maybe they have some mobile. But it seemed to me video would have been like, just go all in on video. If you were a CEO, mm -hmm. what would you have gone all in on if you had to just pick one thing? I don't. I don't think it's a question of one thing. I would. I think the fallacy has always been, let's figure out what the trend is, yeah, and let's follow that mm -hmm. and figure out if you know that will work or not. And I think the part of the problem there is you had a billion people per month coming to um, a suite of products, right. That were very uh, retentive. We're going to continue to come and we're loyal. Right. And what you were doing is you were you were kind of snapping them away from something that they've been doing for such a long time. Right. In, in some cases, ten plus years. And saying just use this completely new paradigm and shift of products. They don't want to. Um, it's very hard to do that. So it's yeah. it's like asking someone who's older um, to change their habits completely, right. and it just gets harder and harder as you get more ingrained. So if you look at any generational products, it typically starts with an audience that's willing to take a risk or take some. They have time to uh, think about that new product. Right. Uh, and I think any company that has eyeballs will always face that. You know, Facebook, Twitter, mm. uh, even Google in some circumstance, where people get used to certain products. So for Yahoo. They had their web portal. They had search intent. Um, they had Yahoo Mail, and people were coming there for that. And right. yeah, you can you can say sports, uh, yeah, finance, sports, stock, finance, et cetera, some of the but stuff. those are still offshoots of their core, which was yeah. news, search, and yeah. mail. Uh, I would have gone back and said, okay, how do I just continue to make these the best products? See, that's what I mean. Across like, multiple I thought platforms. news would have been great if it if they just kept doing more video, yeah. right? And if you look at how podcasting has boomed and talk has boomed, Correct. they were so in the pole position to say on Yahoo, because they had done one early experiment that I thought was really telling. They had Henry Blodgett at, at Business Insider when it was nascent. I don't know if this was during your time, mm -hmm. doing like a Yahoo news program for a couple of years and, on finance. And I was like, this is like, I, I kind of like this as much or more as 
some of CNBC's offering sure. and it increased my habit of coming to finance.yahoo.com. If you typed F in my browser, you went to finance. That was my autocorrect. My most frequent sure. visit was finance. Not, I don't go to Yahoo Finance. Yeah, anymore. I mean, I think um, you know some people would castrate me for saying this, but I think you have a huge problem in the valley after Steve Jobs um, and his perspective of how to build products that everyone wanted to emulate themselves in the same aura of who Steve Jobs was mm. and figure out can I can I look the same, feel the same, can I have this montage of how I think about my <laughs> company, my products, and I think Yahoo fell into that. Yeah, that I have to be the taste maker. Correct. And I don't. I never saw Marissa as a taste maker anyway. So that was a really weird position to put her in, mm -hmm. and also the position of putting her in charge of all those people and not being. I mean, they just should have fired everybody. It would have been so much easier. If she got to half of the people there, but there was this weird drawn out thing, like you're saying, where they were just cutting whatever number of people per month, and it just created this weird mm -hmm. vibe in the culture. Um, what did you learn as a CEO before we get into your investment career? When you look back on yourself as CEO, you did two companies, I think. Uh, I've had like 12 companies. Right. Two that I stayed on my LinkedIn profile. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. When you look back on the entrepreneurial career, what what do you think you did particularly well? And what do you what do you think your limitations were as a founder? Yeah, you know, um, what's really funny is I actually felt that I was a better CEO and leader in the earlier stages of my company's life cycle. Huh. Uh, and then in the mid-tier I did pretty poorly, and then towards the tail end, I did uh, great again because I just kind of learned what happened. Um, we got lucky in our first set of companies. So Lolaps was one of the first companies we had started. Um, and uh, funnily enough, actually, I actually had started a different company. Uh, Lolaps acquired me there. I became the CEO, and then the CEO became my VP of product. And mm. We're still very close today. Um, and what I didn't know enough about the space, right? So I, I think it was more about I was rapidly learning and iterating what I needed to do. And if I thought about myself as a product, what did I need to do in order to become a better leader, uh, product lead in some cases, depending on where we were at the company stage. Um, I think I was, I was just always open to learning from other people's expertise. Mm -hmm. uh, and what happened was that when you finally succeed, all of a sudden it gets to your head and you just have this massive hubris that everything yeah. I learned now is just going to continue on the same pathway. Yeah. And then everything I did was like, oh, it's got to be my way because I know. Uh, right. And I think that was the biggest mistake was that um, it's how can you be how can you be open uh, and stubborn in some cases, but willing to change your mind when you know you're wrong? In a way, in these early days, you're you know, everybody on the ship, it's like a small little SWAT team. It's like yeah. a little SEAL team six. Mm -hmm. But then you start getting into, oh, hey, I'm commanding an entire army mm -hmm. here. And what got you here is not going to get you there. In other words, what got you through phase one is not going to get you through that phase two. Yeah. And it is a really hard shift, right? Like to say, okay, now I'm going to get into radical delegation. I'm going to let people do what they do best and they make the decision. It's also very hard to scale once you go from five to 10 to 15 to 20. It's really hard to scale yourself um, because you've been in so much of the tactical weeds Yeah. Uh, about taking yourself out of that. Mm -hmm. Because then you have this fear that a lot of people will think you're not doing any work but you actually are spending more time strategically thinking about where the company might be moving forward, yeah. assuming you're scaling in that direction. And that's the hardest thing to do because if you are helping, let's just say you were coding with you know, the rest of the engineers that were there for you know, over the last five days, you feel like you're accomplishing something, but you might have not actually compounded your knowledge and your time of what you could do moving forward to help address uh, where the company and the strategy needs to do in order to move forward. Yeah, it's very interesting you, you bring that up because it is something... I faced too as a founder where I was like, well, I'm, I have to write everything. I mm -hmm. have to interview everybody. I have to, you know, be involved in the yeah. sales. And then at a certain point you're like, well, if I'm involved in the location of the next launch festival and getting the speakers and getting yep. the advertisers, this thing can never scale. I, I, I think, I think the key word you used is I, yeah. and so you just have to get used to saying we, yeah. um, and then, and then when I, I think it's actually really great when you say we more often, oh, it's great. you start thinking about okay, well, where are the holes that I have on my team that I need to fill? Right, because where's I'm the Because I'm saying we, we yeah. and, but I actually can't fulfill the, you know, A, B, and C, so I need to get on that. So why did you decide to become an investor? You did pretty well with MessageMe. I think that, that, that was an okay exit for you. Actually, Lolaps was the greatest exit. Ah. MessageMe was great as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it was in, I think it was at a time where like Zynga was starting to plateau yeah. as people stopped caring about the industry, which was yeah. great. And then we had a, a nice outcome with the Japanese company. Right. Um, but uh, I actually started angel investing in 2007. And, Good timing. Um, and it was, it, was actually, um, it was actually at a time frame where I used to listen to what you used to write 
um, huh. Dave McClure at that time frame as right. well. You guys just started having a lot of content out there. Yeah. And so for me, it was as I was thinking about, I have this new company. I don't know as much I need to learn. Right. Um, a lot of it actually started off as if I was to pay my way into understanding where I need to be better, mm -hmm. um, I should just invest in other companies that are at the, at, at the innovation edge, where, who's pushing what. Um, mm. and who's, and who's better, frankly, at what, at, yeah. you know, product management could be technology, could be leadership style management. Uh, so that was actually my way of trying to understand how I could level up myself and my team. Right. Um, and so a lot of those investments in the beginning stages were about areas that I was interested in understanding that could help co propel my company forward. Um, yeah, something I, people greatly underestimate when you make an investment, even if you only put 10 K or 25 K in, you get this massive deluge of knowledge mm -hmm. that could then lead you as a founder or an investor into the next huge outcome in your life. Correct. Because you're not investing in schmoes and dummies. You're investing in the best of the best, the brightest of the brightest here in the greatest arena for startups in the world. And even if they were not successful, you're watching them learn mm -hmm. and you're learning their mistakes and it's like a lab experiment yeah. and you have context as well right and and vice versa right? a yeah. lot of these people were investing in my companies at the same time so i just i got like this crash course while i was building my company and mm -hmm. scaling it from 50 to 250 people and then down to 75 firing oh, a bunch of people that's and the then worst. moving it up to 400 people and getting up to a thousand and again it, it's it just you know this contraction and expansion the layoffs are the worst um, aren't they and then it, it, is, it is the worst it's uh the first time is the worst and then you leg shake under bit, the table yeah. you don't sleep the night before you yeah, go to the bathroom yeah, and puke my co-founder my co-founder had cried i had a tear in my eye because like he was crying and i was like man this is it's this the is worst hard stuff i had one time i was laying people off after the google panda update at mahalo it was like this we just went from you know the 140th largest site in the world to Google can't find us on the internet mm -hmm. magically, mm -hmm. and I was like, I'm laying people off, and this one woman is crying, this young lady, and it was her first job at a school, and I said, it's gonna be okay. You're like super talented. You're gonna get severance, and we're gonna, you know. And she's like, no, it's not that. I know I'm gonna get into a job. I got like three offers already. Mm -hmm. She's like, well, what's wrong? She goes, I just love it here, yeah. and I was just like, oh, no, it felt good. Shot. I remember when we did our first riff. Yeah. Um, one of the employees that we let go, um, he sa said, like, we're going to have an after party of everyone there. And they actually invited me. So out of the 40, 50 people that we fired, um, invited you. they invited us to come and talk. To, and it was, a, it, was, it was a good crew of people because yeah. we had spent, it was during that time frame where actually no one could find jobs. So you all, you had this cluster of people in the community coming together to mm. help each other out and propel, propel, propel forward. Yeah. Um, and so when you work together for four or five years um, and watching everyone go through the motions of the struggle, yeah, um, it, it kind of bands you together. Right, it does, it does. So let's talk about, you You become uh, an invest, you do the angel investing, but then you decide to join social capital. How, mm -hmm. What was that decision? How did Chim you find Chamath or Chamath find you? Did you? Was it a recruiter or something? Or you sort of wanted, or you just met him? How, sure. how do you wind up at social capital? Because this is, I think, the, you know, of all the new funds, it's the most successful right now. Yeah. So, uh, funny story. I during the lapse stage, I had spent some time with Chamath when he was at Facebook. Ah. And the first thing he had told me was, "You'll probably fail on the Facebook platform, so we will just acquire you." That oh. really pissed me off. So I was like, "Fuck that! I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna work as hard as possible to make it successful." Yeah. We did make it successful. And then when I was uh, transitioning out after we had sold and I'd been there for about a year mm. and thinking about what I wanted to do next, um, you know, in in parallel, Chamath and his co-founders I'd also met. Uh, previously and I had pitched them and they basically came back and said, hey, we just started Social Capital about six months ago, got a new place, new office. We'd love to have you and your team sit there. I know you're going to do something new. Yeah. Um, just come as an EIR. Um, I had just had my first kid. Um, you know, I was, I was like, cool, free health insurance. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. Um, so I was there and I saw what they were incubating, a bunch of other companies, uh, some of which are, you know, there today and, and scaling really well. Um, again, it was just like a band of a lot of um, smart people around the table. Um, and as well as my team and I started my company, went off, uh, got funded, um, you know, did, did the whole, um, servitude to Yahoo for a while, <laughs> the, the tour of duty. Uh, and in parallel, I had started, um, angel investing at a higher and faster clip. Um, then I had my own angel slash seed fund and I had a bunch of some LPs and, uh, you know, and I think when I was thinking about moving forward, um, you know, they just came back and said, Hey, um, can you replicate in some ways some of the success you've had with uh, the community of uh, companies you've built out 
um, the success of some of the companies you've been in really early mm. um, and um, just writing larger check, would you, would you want to do that at social yeah. capital? And I had already uh, had thought that I would go into venture eventually, just probably not that soon. Mm. Uh, and then I think the conversation just progressed and it was exciting because the way in which uh, we approach uh, venture investing today at the earliest stages to the other life cycle uh, was very similar to my thesis of what I wanted to build, mm. but they were already in that direction. So I thought, okay, if I like the people, I like the mission, I like um, the way in which we're going to make investments, uh, might as well just What join is your the team. thesis around angel investing? What, did you have a, a core thesis on what you know increases the chances of a great outcome yeah. as an investment? Or do you have a way, do you pick founders, do you pick markets, do you pick products? What do you look for? Yeah, so if you, um, uh, I go back and forth on this the year to year because it changes. Uh, but I think at the earliest stages when people are coming together to build an idea or a product, I think all you're assessing is uh, the team's ability to execute, rapidly learn, and become better and better. Mm. Um, I mean, can they compound and become better and better? And depending on what they build, it doesn't matter what they shift into, um, can, like, do they have the resiliency to figure that out? Mm. And um, so product and market mean a little bit less because the team might change their product, might change the market they're going after. So I think the team matters. But then that's why your check sizes are much smaller at that stage yeah. than a larger check size. Um, and then I think as time progresses, then product and market become more and more important around what they're focused on. Because right. you can have a really good profitable business, but it not, might not be a venture um, scale return. Yeah. Um, and so then I think that's where market makes a big difference as well, where, where you're spending your time. Because again, good product, bad market, yeah. uh, really good market, mediocre team, uh, mediocre product could also still work. Yeah. It, you have seen that a huge market can lift a really average team, mm -hmm. and propel them to great success. Correct. And you're like, wow, these people, I didn't think these people could do it. Yeah. But the market was behind them. The wind was at their sails. And, yeah. and, the, and the other part is, take off. could it be a mediocre team that becomes better over time and you need to ah. assess that ability? Yeah. Um, and so I would, I would say probably 50% of my angel investments and even early seed bets have been more around, do I like their product? Do I like the market they're focused on? And is, do I think the team just has the capability? It might not be the greatest team, uh, but do I think they have the capability to become great over time? How do you source your deals now that you're in this sort of, I know social capital probably has inbound. Mm -hmm. People know about them. They see Jamal on CNBC. They, they see you out there in the field. Sure. Um, and they say, maybe I'll just send a business plan or whatever. But I'm assuming the cold over the transom, you know, decks are not as good as the ones that come from people you know. So how do you source deals? Yeah, I have a pretty wide... Um lens and aperture towards what I'm looking for, what I might be interested in. Yeah. So I've actually, I'm actually more outbound and cold really? email kind of person, Interesting. Uh, which is like, hey, I've been spending time in you know X industry and, and like like this approach. Do you just have time to have a chat or a coffee, whatever it may be? So uh, then the founders And in like... some cases, even a phone call. Wow. Um, so actually a lot of my angel investments, some are obviously inbound as you um, have progression and you know mm. a lot of those founders introduce you to other founders. Uh, but a lot of it was more like, hey, I heard about your company and saw what you did. Um, I saw a talk, maybe a blog post, um, just some understanding. Um, I started building my own sort of query search and engines when I was doing seed. Um, so if I saw something that was interesting or would tick up, I would just reach out. Huh. So you made queries on AngelList or Crunchbase? Uh, uh, Crunchbase in the beginning, AngelList at some point. Yeah. Um, a lot of app store sort of de denominations of what was happening in different industries. That's how I found a company called TrueCaller in Sweden. Um, TrueCaller I know in Sweden, yeah, sure, of course. Yeah. So seed stage, I reached yeah. out to them cold. Wow. Yeah. And you made that investment. I made that investment. Uh, when you were at social, when you were uh, when I was at Message Me, actually. Wow. Yeah. So you just knew True Caller, which obviously, for people who don't know, will tell you who's calling you, and it, you, if you yeah, mark just, something as spam, everybody else gets to mark it as spam, and you they build yeah. like sort of a central it's, database of numbers. It's much more region based, but I would yeah. say in some cases it's um, it's white pages to the max, um, and you know white pages does exist here in the United States. So I would say it's not as corn central here. Um, but if you are in Europe, um, Africa, India, Asia in general, like it's a huge problem because they never had that infrastructure. Mm. Um, then, you know, they never had caller ID. And so it's a new concept. And so yeah. in the same way, I would say you had like WhatsApp kind of, you know, everyone 2020 hindsight, they said, oh, you know, we should have paid attention to it. But in 2008, 2009, 2010, they were growing, but no one was paying attention to them. Right. Yeah. But, but it was by all watching the app store, you know. Yeah. Um, which is interesting. Yeah. Okay. So when we get back uh, from this quick break, I want to talk to you a little bit about, and wow, wow true, Co true caller is now a unicorn mm -hmm. and you invested in the seed stage, probably worth five, 10 million bucks. 
Yeah, so, I don't. I don't really count or think about it, but in the early stages. Yeah, if it was ten million, you're a hundred X now. There's a lot. There's a lot of companies like that that you've invested in. Uh, you know. I hope so. In the yeah. Future. yeah. All right. When we get back, we're going to go through some of your investments in our portfolio review on Angel, the podcast. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Let me take a moment to thank NetSuite from Oracle. Yes, the results are in. If you look at Survey Inc.'s 5,000 companies, the top 5,000 companies, the top five barriers to growth for those companies were, one, it takes finance way too long to close the books. I experience this all the time. Two, our company is too slow to launch new products. We got a bottleneck. Number three, hiring and keeping good people. This is critical for all companies. You know that. Four, managing your cash. You need to have cash in the bank, right? You don't want to run out. And five, too many disconnected systems, making it hard for you to get a full picture of your business. Now, it sounds like these businesses have outgrown their business and financial management systems. You know that you use spreadsheets and QuickBooks and all these other systems, uh, and they're fine at the start. I get it. You're saving money, and you don't really know what you're doing. Well, you know, it takes twice as long to get simple things done, sometimes 10 times as long, and it's not going to be accurate. And you need those accurate answers to make decisions for your business, and that's where NetSuite comes in. They are the number one system for growing your company. It's the one system that tracks and manages revenue, cash flow, HR, inventory, projects, and even e-commerce, and for every single industry. It doesn't matter if you're in software, hardware, a marketplace, B2B, B2C, B2B to C, does not matter. NetSuite's going to work great for you, and you can run your entire business from your dashboard on your desktop or even on your mobile phone. And that's why thousands of companies use NetSuite. It's the only system that you need to run your business. So here's your call to action, everybody. Go to netsuite.com slash angel. Please go to netsuite.com slash angel and get your free guide crushing the five barriers to growth. That's right. We talked about those five barriers earlier, and you're going to be able to crush those five barriers, doing the books, HR, launching new products, managing cash, and all the disparate systems you use to try to figure out what's going on. You're going to go crush those five barriers to growth at netsuite.com slash angel. Please go there, netsuite.com slash angel, and get that free guide. It's the only system you're going to need to run your business. Let's all say thank you to NetSuite from Oracle for supporting independent media like Angel and for supporting season two of this amazing podcast. We've had so many great guests on and it's all because we have NetSuite support. So I, just from me to you, NetSuite team, thank you. And on behalf of the audience, thank you. Okay, let's get back to this amazing conversation. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Angel, the podcast. You can vi visit us, angelpodcast.com. We're also on Spotify now. Thank you to our friends at Spotify for including us in their awesome new podcasting app. And if you love the show, go ahead and write a review on iTunes and rate it. That's super helpful. Helps other people find it. My guest today is Arjun Sati. Sati? Sati. I got it. Whatever works for you. No, I got to get it right. Sati, right? Sati. Go by Sethi, and then I go by Sethi, depending on who Sethi. I'm talking to. Some people say Sethi. It's pronounced Sati. Sethi. Sethi. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and he is a partner at Social Capital. I don't know your title. I'm a partner. Partner. Yeah. And you focus on the early stage at Social Capital. You lead that group, or? I lead the venture group. You lead the venture group. And that's early stage to Series A, seed uh, to Series A? How does it It's actually seed to um, Series B and C in some cases. Wow. Yeah. Um, what is the seed strategy over there at Social Capital today? Um, because we know the firm uh, has gotten much bigger mm -hmm. and has much bigger aspirations to play, you know, not just in the venture space, but all the way up until hedge funds and mm -hmm. cryptocurrencies and then all the way back down to seed. So where does seed fit into all of this? Because I hear Chamat say all the time on uh, different um, podcasts and when he's speaking that he is stage agnostic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so part, part of the strategy at Social Capital has been uh, we don't want to miss at any stage of a company's life cycle, and we also want to learn and continue to figure out uh, what are the best ways in which to invest, right? So some of it is data-driven and uh, what parts are qualitative. So we have this shared platform and learning. Hmm. So for Seed, it's more about, as I mentioned, uh, you know, what are the particular verticals that we want to understand about a company, and then what check size do we want to participate in. Uh, do we want to take a community-based approach of we like this ecosystem, so let's invest in a bunch of companies in the ecosystem, uh, or do we like like one company in this category? I think we, you know, for us, what we drew back from, and this comes this comes back from my seed um, fun days, uh, was that you had a lot of party rounds. You had a lot of people saying, 
Um, you know, we want a certain allocation or percentage of the company. Um, and that's really hard at the seed stage. And a lot of these funds, I would say, including us in some capacity, uh, weren't, wouldn't be there to help because their check size might be too small or the ownership might be too small. So we separated, um, at least at the earliest stage, what do we want to do with incubations? What do we want to do with seed? And how do we want to think about early stage venture where we take a board seat? Uh, so we started um, debating this. And then uh, in some ways, you start experimenting uh, what's working, what's not. Yeah. What's worked really well um, till date, and this is, uh, again, an artifact of what worked at, at my seed fund, is uh, you deploy small amounts of capital in areas that you think are interesting and people that you believe are interesting. Uh, and ecosystems that you believe are interesting. And then you start deploying more and more capital as you start seeing progression. Mm. That means you're paying attention. It means you have a system and tools in place, even community in some cases, to help propel these people, these companies together. What's an example of this? Um, so space and satellite communications, I would say, is one where we focused on social capital, where we made a bunch of bets across the board. We learned more and more about what was happening in that industry. We chose two companies where we deployed more capital, one at the seed stage, one in the Series A. Um, and it what just are gave, those companies? Are they public that you invested in? Uh, one of them we don't talk about, okay. uh, Stealth, but a, another one is called Relativity Space. Oh. Um, they're the 3D printing uh, company where they're actually building the like the full space rocket, hmm. um, start like from the hull to the engine itself. And the whole goal was how do we reduce thousands of parts into um, single digits. I saw Chamath tweeted of uh, them firing their engines for the first time, mm -hmm. and they were able to fire an engine with three pieces in it, or uh, something like that. Correct. correct. Is that right? Three pieces? Yeah, it's three pieces. So this is going to compete against SpaceX, I guess. Correct. It's. I mean, the, the it's a dual prong approach. One is they're 3D printing the engines. Mm. So the miracle is that we have to create the engines and we have to create the space rocket that works. And they have to create the printer that can allow them to print those pieces. Wow. So it's two different pieces in parallel that they have, they have to build. They they've, were able to do both. Uh, but what's great is in order for us to understand this industry, where in the stack we wanted to invest, we started investing small amounts of capital in the ecosystem mm. to figure out where we want to spend our time. What, what's a typical check size when you do a seed stage investment? And what type of valuations are in that range? Yeah. Uh, I would say, you know, uh, we invest 25 to 250K uh, mm. on average. And I know that delta is pretty large, uh, but th those, are, those are the numbers that we invest in. Um, and then we'll start investing more and more capital as time goes on. Mm. Um, the valuations we'll see between five or 10 million cap, sometimes yeah. four, depending on regions. Yeah. Um, and we, you know, we will do caps that are a little bit larger if we believe more in that space or that ecosystem. How do you communicate to the founder what the goalposts will be to get continued funding? Because this has uh, been called the signaling risk in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. A VC firm puts, you know, Sequoia, a Sequoia scout like I was, mm -hmm. puts money into an investment, but Sequoia doesn't do the Series A. Mm -hmm. Does that mean they don't love Thumbtack? Well, they did the Series B. Sure. You know, it's... Is this an issue anymore, signaling? It seems like it was an issue 10 years ago, or it was a concern, maybe not an issue, a concern. Is it a concern now? It doesn't feel like it to me. I, I think, know. you know, I think it was a concern in the past because you just had so many different companies get funded. Uh, and I, I think the main problem is you have a large fund coming in and saying, hey, we want some amount of ownership. Um, who knows what that might be? And they say, we also need to deploy at least $400,000, $500,000. The problem with that is if the company... Now you see more and more companies raise up to like three, four million dollars in their seed round. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you had one of these major major institutions just give you the first 400K and then never pile on later on, yeah, I think it's a pretty bad signal. Mm -hmm. Not to say it's a good or bad thing for the company, but it could be a bad signal, especially if you raise your first million and a half and you need subsequent rounds of funding to help propel you forward. Yeah. Um, so again, our mechanism is we might give you the first 25K check. We might give you this 50K check. We might even give you another 75K check after that. Uh, but that means we will participate in subsequent rounds of funding. Right. So we take a different approach. Yeah. And I think, yeah, it probably would not be a great signal if we don't participate moving forward right. um, in your subsequent seed rounds. Uh, but we always never participate in the Series A. But we do. our goal is to help the companies get to the Series A. So out of the, I want to say, 100 companies we've done in the last year and a half, about 20% of them have raised subsequent rounds where uh, we may or may not have participated. I don't know the number off the top of my head. Uh, but out of that, um, the t I would say 10% have raised Series A, and only two of them have been from us. Amazing. Yeah, yeah and see, I think this is where the statistics lead me to believe it's becoming less of an issue in the Valley, where it feels like it could be a negative signal, but I think people are so busy and there's so many investments 
that we all look at it and say, we're, we're all drowning here mm -hmm. in deal flow. Mm -hmm. There's too many deals. There's too many good companies. There's too much traction amongst too many companies to even make a decision. How is that what you're going through at social capital when you have a popular firm that's invested in things like Slack and have breakout success? Is there just too much incoming for you guys to sort through over there? Um, you know, I, uh, I would say yes and no. Um, I mean, there are areas and sectors we know we're not going to invest in. Hmm. Um, so those are easy to filter out. Uh, and we let the entrepreneurs know that ahead of time. Uh, but we're also continually learning areas of interest for us, right? Like Frontier was not that large uh, of an investment category for us at least three to four years ago. Now it's a pretty large part of our portfolio. And what does where it mean, want Frontier? So, yeah. So funnily enough, I would say um, all hard tech, hmm. right? So things that were... Um, uh, semiconductor, chips, AI, ML, uh, which probably shouldn't be called Frontier, but um, we call them Frontier. Mm. And uh, space, satellite communications, part of Frontier, food, agricultural tech, areas where they just haven't been considered uh, traditionally consumer metrics or enterprise metrics, yeah. at least over the last 20 years. You could say maybe traditional venture investing over 30 years ago, coming back, we're calling that Frontier today. Yeah. Well, and you guys are doing the TensorFlow team mm -hmm. is building a chip over there. That's public now. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an example of something that's super frontier tech. Yeah, like, uh, amazing team, amazing tech. Uh, I would say it's a, a very traditional uh, venture deal um, uh, in, in the frontier tech space. What are they doing over there? What's what's the name of that? Is that an, is there a name for that company? Yeah, the name of the company is Grok. 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 Kruk. Yeah. G R O Q. Grok. Like as in Grok, as I understand, mm -hmm. G R O Q. Mm -hmm. When does their product come out? These are a bunch of Google folks, I guess, and they were working on machine learning AI, mm -hmm. and now they're making a chip. And this is something you guys source them over at Social Capital and and back them. You're the first and only backers of them, from what I understand. I don't know if that's true. Uh, we are currently the first and only backers. Yeah. So this is like a big, crazy bet, right? To do something like that. I don't think it's that crazy. I mean, we spent so much time again learning by making seed investments, learning about the ecosystem. Ah. Uh, we had an understanding of where we wanted to deploy more capital, mm -hmm. um, and they were one of the bets that we took. Got it. So you do these seed, seed, seed. You're, you're placing a bunch of little bets. Mm -hmm. You find the TensorFlow team or this team that's doing Grok eventually, and you're like, this is the one to go all in on. Yeah, I think the, the best way to think about it is, and you've done this in your past life, is yeah. you're making investments in a category and an ecosystem because you like what's happening. There's a, there's a flavor or a certain amount of herd mentality, but... Do you really want to participate in some things that may be overblown? And maybe you don't want to be a part of the herd mentality. Maybe you don't want to yeah. invest in that ecosystem, but you don't know yet. Um, so part of it is learning in the early stages. And yeah. do you want to deploy more capital? You might deploy more capital to those companies as you're learning. You're also helping them propel. Mm -hmm. Or you decide, I actually want to invest in a company that I heard about that all of these companies are using. Maybe it's on the B2B enterprise side. Um, don't know. And I think part of it is a lot of people opine and say, we know, we love this. We saw the founders' eyes. We believe in it. Uh, but if you actually go back in history, they, they didn't. And it might have been the only company in the ecosystem. Uh, mm -hmm. Or there might have only been three companies in the ecosystem. So they chose one of three. Today, you're choosing one out of n number of companies. It could be in the thousands in some cases. Hmm. Is there a type of founder um, or founder traits across the social capital portfolio when you look at it and you say, yeah, our founders have this in common that you can think of that just comes to mind off the top of your head? No, you know what's interesting is every company is unique. Every founder is unique in their own way. Um, they operate their companies in some cases so much different. Um, and it's really interesting to watch them execute. You have two great companies execute completely different, but, it, but you, there's, there would be no way to bring one culture into the other because then it would just fail. The whole thing would fall apart. Right. So there's no one way to succeed just your way and your ability to execute on your strategy. Yeah, we tell a lot of our founders, and I say this just, you know, there was something special about what you built um, and helped you propel from stage to stage. Just continue to do that better. And here are like the basic accounting principles of growth or retention, mm. uh, revenue, unit economics that you want to use, and then plug that into the way and what you do really well. Tell us uh, about this capital as a service idea. Um, I think it's called capital as a service. Correct. CAS. CAS. Mm -hmm. I heard this and I was like, that's the opposite of what I do. I'm trying to actually, and I think Chamath and I have a, a, a core difference here. I'm trying to pick people. Mm -hmm. I think I'm good at reading people. Mm -hmm. And there's very few metrics there. And you said earlier in the seed stage. So is CAS something that works later stage when you have a lot of traction? Or does this CAS algorithm and this process you're doing uh, work for when there's not a lot of data? 
Yeah. How do you how do you look at that versus what what we seed stage people typically do, which is we pick teams. Mm -hmm. we, we we look for people who have purpose and mission and mm -hmm. you know skills, right? Yeah. So where where I'd agree with you is at the earliest stage, you don't have a lot of data, mm -hmm. so it's harder to make those types of bets. So you're making team bets rather yeah. than product and market bets. Right. Cast comes in right in between. I want to say what we call seed plus now ah. and the earliest stages of seed kind of right in the middle where there's some amount of um, uh, momentum, some certain amount of traffic, certain amount of revenue, certain amount of data and metrics mm. where you're starting to able to see what a company is doing without the bias of all the other parts. Mm. And I think that's our beginning stages of learning and understanding what's happening in, in my opinion, just all across the world because mm. companies are not just being built here. They're being built all over the place and there's ecosystems just like, you know, burgeoning in different areas. That's really interesting. And then what we're able to do is allow them to see, like allow them to propel forward as well by saying, here's a benchmark of other companies at your stage. Here's where they're at. Here's how you need to think. And I think mm -hmm. they, and I think if, if we can do a really good job there, then we can help propel these companies and communities where we're investing. Yeah. It was very interesting. I had sent a enterprise company and it's maybe two years ago that was doing their series B. They got the series B done. Social capital didn't do it, but they gave the founder a report on here's where your versus here's where you stand versus Slack and companies we haven't invested in like Yammer in terms of enterprise growth. Mm -hmm. And just here's the fastest growing enterprise companies, mm -hmm. and here's you. Mm -hmm. And there's a problem with churn and there's a problem with retention here. And you know, he, here's where we would like to see you in order. And the founder was just like, wow, this was like the great why didn't they invest? They put all this work into it. Mm -hmm. It was confounding to them. Mm -hmm. You know that a fir the firm that did the most work did didn't invest, and the firms that didn't do as much work did invest. Yeah, we have a um, you know we have a philosophy where we want to be as transparent as possible with the founders when we meet them. Hmm. Uh, and again, it was very in line with the way in which I had done my seed strategy, which is like here are the parts where I feel you might have holes, and here's where I'd like to help, and here's how you know you know why you should take my capital, and and why I want to be on this journey with you. Uh, and for us is I think um, as a founder, what was really frustrating was you'd go and pitch. You do all this work. You'd work with one of these partners for a long time. In some cases, maybe an associate or principal underneath. You spend a lot of time building a relationship. You go back and forth. Um, you go do this partner meeting and you never hear back from them mm. or and they never they, they never properly tell you what were the real reasons why they passed. And so what we wanted to do is say, hey, we do a lot of work across ecosystems, across companies, and we have a thesis around why we may or may not invest. It doesn't mean we're right or wrong. It just means here's our process and here's how we did the work. And so we want to share that with you. Yeah. And if it helps you be a better company, then you'll come back to us at some point and prove yeah. us wrong, which is great. And we want to, we want to continue to support that. Or uh, you're a great company. We, want to, we're in, we have full alignment with you. Um, and let's figure out a way to partner. And so yeah. we share our memos, we share like all the work we do. In some cases, um, our official reference calls, um, we'll share all that back with the founder. Wow. Yeah, so it takes a lot of time. For every hour you meet with the founder, how much more work goes into the process, would you say, on the seed stage early, you know? I don't think it actually takes that much time because you were already doing that work, you just didn't share it before. Right. But I'm saying if you were to look at the, let's say you have a one hour meeting with a company, mm -hmm. How much more work do you do on average before and after that meeting relating to that company, do you think? In yeah, other I mean, words, what's, th what's underneath the iceberg? I think it depends on if you are doing more work to understand um, this ecosystem, this company, yeah. and do you feel like it is a company that may warrant, um, again, f more um, like capital from you? And do you want to take that time to understand it? So, yeah, in some cases, you take a look at a company and say, hey, we already have, you know, 10 benchmarks in the space. We don't like this ecosystem. And we just tell the founder that yeah. and say, here's the work we've already done for the last two years. And so this is why we don't want to make these investments. But for new areas, you're you're taking a lot of time. Yeah. I mean, in some cases, um, there's this one company I've been working on probably for 10 months, just trying to understand the space and see if I want to take the bet. Wow. Um, and so some people will say that's crazy, um, but for me, I'm just continuing to learn, see how they're um, executing. They're okay with it. I'm helping in some ways, and yeah. you know, and if I'm ready to pull the trigger, I'm ready to pull the trigger. If not, then I'm going to help them make sure that they can find uh, the capital they need. I, I still could be wrong, but um, you know, you spend your time where you think there's going to be, you know, large returns. It's interesting if you think about, like, when you get a no from an investor, it's never a no. It's a not yet. Mm -hmm. It's like if you were to prove them wrong, mm -hmm. 
in all likelihood, you're going to raise four or five more rounds of capital before an exit. Mm -hmm. In which case, why wouldn't you take their capital in the next five rounds if they invest in those stages? Mm -hmm. And you said social capital invests the entire stage. Mm -hmm. So the more goodwill you build, the more candidness you give, the the better off they are. Founders have to play the long game. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, investors and, have and been so, playing the long game for a long time. And so do we. Yeah. We have to play the long game as well. And, yeah. and it's not a game. We have to build the relationships in order yeah. to show that we can be helpful. Yeah. I mean, you you are going to make mistakes. So then this, the frustrating part is when people will tell you, Oh my God, I love it. Mm -hmm. This is amazing. Mm -hmm. You are tremendous. I got this once with an LP. We are, you're amazing. And this is exactly what we're looking for. And you're going to be so successful. I was like, great. And they're like, but it's not a fit for us. And I was like, but you just said you're looking for it. I'm great. And my track record is indisputable. And they're like, yeah, so what we were thinking is we meet twice in the next year and then maybe in your next fund. And I'm like, wow, I, you have no credibility now. You you, you yes. basically just lied to me and snowed me. Like, just tell me you don't like me or you don't like my approach or you don't like this aspect. I would much rather get that candid feedback. Just think of it this way. And this is probably why you like being an angel. Yeah. You're able to have very candid conversations Oof, with your companies. Ever. Yeah. Um, so... You know, in the interest of transparency and helping the companies move forward, yeah. that's where we want to get to. We want to make sure that we're partners with um, all of these companies, even if we don't exi um, mm. invest. Right. And so as time moves on, we want them to be calling us regardless. At its core, what is a startup in your mind? When you think about what we do here in Silicon Valley, what do you think is a startup? What is, what is it the essential nature of one? Yeah, that, that's a great question. You know, um, I... I think one of these startup to startup events, I don't know if you were there or not, mm. it's possible. Um, Steve Blank was, you know, yeah. up on stage and, and, and like that quote never goes away for me is um, entrepreneurs, the, the reason why um, he believes they're successful um, is that they have an irrational passion towards solving something mm. um, and that they have this religious fanaticism. And I think that word is, it's hard to use today with what's happening in the world. Sure. Uh, but I truly believe in is that they have this religious fanaticism around solving that problem or figuring out what's next within that space. It's an unnatural, unhealthy obsession. Correct. And so if you're a startup, what you're really doing is creating, we use the word culture, but right. you're creating a sense of fanaticism. You're creating a cult. I mean, it is true. And, you know, obviously there's triggers and some baggage about using fanaticism. We're not talking about terrorism here, but we're talking about a belief in yourself and the problem and the team mm -hmm. that will never go away. That's so in your soul mm -hmm. that you believe it to be true, even in the face of failure. Mm -hmm. I mean, the great entrepreneurs hit these horrible failure moments and it inspires the team more, mm -hmm. right? You just think about what happened with Elon blowing up the third rocket and he's mm -hmm. like, well, now we got to get back to work. Yeah, just we, keep going. Keep going. Resiliency is everything. If you're not resilient, I mean, you're going to, and if you're not passionate fanatically about the product you're building, you're going to wake up the next day and, I mean, let's face it, it's so hard to be a founder. It's a, it's a very reasonable decision to quit. Mm -hmm. That's the word. And as a founder, sometimes you can't quit because you also can't get another job. So you just have to keep going. <laughs> Being unhirable yeah. is a super benefit to a great founder. If you think yeah. about some of the best founders we ever had. It's a superpower. It, their superpower is being unmanageable and unable to function with anybody else being in charge. Mm -hmm. Like literally just go down the line. I mean, who would ever be Elon Musk's boss or Travis's boss or, you know, Zuckerberg's boss? Like these are people or Bezos, like you can't possibly be their boss. Yeah. I mean, at some point they did have bosses in some, at some point in their life. Yeah, for like three months. Yeah, so it'd be really interesting to hear what those people thought. Yeah, I think what they thought was like, this person is unmanageable. I mm -hmm. need to get them out of this organization because I can't deal with them. Yeah. They're just... <laughs> you know, like literally every job, I had two or three jobs in my life where I worked for other people and almost uniform, almost universally, I was working longer hours than the person I was reporting into and mm -hmm. it made me furious. Mm -hmm. It set in me an anger that my boss was leaving at six o'clock and that I was more passionate about what we were doing and the customers we had than they were. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's infuriating. Like, if your boss can't keep up with you, and I think the key is that they can't keep up with you. I'm not sure time is specific to that. I mean, the amount well, of time they spend. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it just it is an indication when people leave at 5:59 that I, mean, <laughs> I guess we have kids now. We can we can give a. Has it changed you much since you have the kids? 
Uh, you I think on the world. Uh, no, you know, actually, ever since I had my kids, I started working harder. Actually, oh, um, explain. I think What's your theory. I think I think it's just a, a sense of um, now I'm uh, now I kind of know what's more at stake than what was ever before, mm. and I want to make sure I can help sort of um, think through problems. And maybe I think maybe I've just become a lot more uh, a lot more risk on, but in a more methodical way than I was before. It's probably a better way to put it. Interesting. Uh, you want to take risk. I do want to take more risks. Yeah. yeah. It is against human nature to take risk. How do you reprogram yourself to be okay with risk? Uh, I think, again, it becomes that irrationality. So I kind of just delete what I think. Uh, whenever someone says, here's what could go wrong, I just pre pretend like that could not happen. Yeah. I, I, I had a habit very similar to that one where I'd write down, I was writing in my book when I was early days of angel investing, what I thought was going to stop this company. Mm -hmm. And then at a certain point I would write it because your mind wants to get that out. Mm -hmm. These are the things I hate. These are the things that are just going to crush this company. Mm -hmm. Google's going to create a competitive product, that's regulation. Where, that's where I think that's where bias comes in. Yeah. And so there's two ways of approaching it. You, one, you can say, uh, what could go wrong with this company? Yeah. Or you can say, what outcomes that does this company need to prove in order to hit an right. outsized um, return or an outsized yeah. um uh, outcome hmm. and then it, it 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 gives you a different perspective of the type of data that you want to go collect in huh. order to understand if you want to actually make this bet yeah then i would cross out that list and i'd write down like the one or two things that could go right yeah like here here's a couple of things that could go right you know what maybe uber maybe they'll come up with a product that's so cheap that they'll triple the size of the market mm -hmm. you know that's was that was my thinking was i take carry car service and it cost me $120 to come from the airport. What if that cost half? I would have started using carry car service earlier in my life when I had less money. Because mm -hmm. before that, I used to try to find a friend to drop me off at the airport, mm -hmm. or I would take the you, subway. You've probably seen many companies, so I'll give you this same similar anecdote. Um, my dad saw Google. He passed on it because he'd invested in five of their search companies. Oh. Um, I passed on Instagram, uh, oh. even though I was sitting on Dogpatch Labs. Oh um, yeah, that would. By the way, Dog Patch Labs when he was working on Bourbon over there. Correct. Yeah, and my that's where my, we and, held the Open Angel Forum. Mm -hmm. That was in that Dog Patch Lab pier that got shut down, where Uber in presented and Cyan, myself, and um, first round invested. Yeah, and then uh, you worked out of that. The Dog Patch Labs. I, I was there, there for a little bit. Yeah. Who did that? It was a venture firm who had done Dog Patch Labs. Polaris Venture. Partners. Polaris. They were my investors in Volaps. What an innovative idea they had. They mm -hmm. created WeWork. In essentially like a co-working space. What's great is you had a com this is where I think people miss um, on the transactional side is you had a community of people that were all working together. Ah. And in some cases, this is probably the early days of YC or even what you see now at yeah. launch, you have a community of people working together ah. and it, it's possible someday in their lives in the future, if um, their first companies don't work out, maybe even their second ones, they come together and they build, and they build the next one and they succeed. Yep. And I think you saw a lot of that um, at the early stages of 20, 2007, 2008, et cetera. For sure, for sure. Um, all right, listen. Oh, you know what you were talking about? Um, what metrics to look for for the outsized return? Did you figure out what those metrics are? Because I've been wondering. I, I'm, I'm still trying to figure that out. The metrics that would be outsized returns. Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, you know, that's, that's probably a little bit of a lie. I think everything comes down to product team and market. And market, you gotta, you just have to do the math to say, in success, if these people are successful with the product they're approaching, mm -hmm. what would that math look like? And I think Bill Gurley did a great job with Uber, which is to say, what would the disruption market look like um, if they were to take over cabs, right? Like this is the market size. It's like You, you yeah. kind of have to be able to paint a picture of where you think it could go. You could be wrong, but it's, a, it's directionally focused on uh, how a company could look like with gross demand. It's really interesting because we live in a time where, where people stick their neck out and have a crazy idea. Maybe it's just social media. Mm -hmm. Everybody attacks them. Mm -hmm. We always attack the new idea, the new person, so brutally. And I was asking people to give me their ideas and I would grade them, which is kind of paradoxical. Like, mm -hmm. I'm going to grade it. Like, it was kind of my joke. That's why I don't grade your companies when they come in. I know. It makes me – well, I asked you to pick your favorites, the top three, but yeah. it's fine. That's I, a form of grading. It is, but in the incubator, the reason I do that is because it lets people under, it's, it's twofold. One, it creates um, a buy-in from the investors, if they say it's their number one, mm -hmm. that 
means they're going to take a meeting with them because mm-hmm. you can't possibly pick your number one and then not take a meeting. Mm-hmm. So that's just my little Jedi mind trick. Here, here's historically what I've seen and in, in, in my own yeah. personal mistakes. Um, a lot of the greatest investments that I lost because I was too reactionary yeah. and I didn't take the time to synthesize and think. Huh. And so, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I'm, I'm privileged that I was able to invest in open door, rubric, Oof. clutter, gusto. Uh, but if I, if I think about just, Gusto's great too. if I just think about those names um, as being like some of the first early checks, um, when I first heard a lot of these pitches and a lot of these guys are my friends, yeah. um, I said no huh. in, my, in my mind. But, in, but I said, like, let me just take a day or two to think about it. Right. Let me try to understand the market a little bit more. And in in success, what could these companies look like? Right. I'm not saying that I predicted these outcomes in any way, shape, or form. Because actually, they're a lot bigger than I thought from a success standpoint. Yeah. Um, but, like, I could have said no. That's the thing is, you, you know, taking your time and freeing yourself from having to be the decider mm-hmm. of if this is going to work or not. You don't need to decide if it's going to work or not. You need to decide if these founders are passionate, skillful, and they've got some early customers and some early traction. Mm-hmm. These are things you can actually decide on. But ultimately, the thing none of us anticipated, even Bill, as smart as he is, and he's an incredible strategist, I don't think any of us we thought car replacement. Like people would get rid of their cars mm-hmm. and go full Uber. Mm-hmm. But I was recently, we had a founder university, and I asked people how many people, or no, I was speaking at a book signing, and I said, how many people have given up their car completely? They were from Brazil. Mm-hmm. And I said, how many of you don't own cars because of Uber you know, and you, or Lyft or whatever ride-sharing service you're using? And out of the 100 people in the room, like six or seven raised their hands. And I was like, that's the market that nobody, mm-hmm. not even the founders, mm-hmm. could have predicted that somebody would go full Uber mm-hmm. or full Lyft or full ride-sharing, mm-hmm. that they just would get rid of their car. I, I completely agree. And what's funny is, um, I remember when like Naval, maybe even you had sent out Uber. Yeah. I thought it was the dumbest idea possible, like a 1% problem. So I'll, yeah. I'll admit that. Yeah. And then o- and over time, I have gotten rid of my car. I have no car. I use either Uber or Lyft like exclusively. Right. Um, and it just it's just much more free. And you, the other thing people didn't realize when they were making that calculation, everybody made the calculation based on my car costs 500 a month, my parking space is 200, mm-hmm. my insurance is 200, it's mm-hmm. 900, mm-hmm. my Uber bill will be 1400. Mm-hmm. What they never took into account was, and your car is a depreciating asset at the same right. time. Right. Yeah. But they never took into account that even if Uber is a little bit more, they would recapture an hour a day. Mm-hmm. And if you recapture an hour a day, maybe your that's worth more. Mm-hmm. That ability to sleep, read, work. do a phone call, work, yeah. and that you could recapture an hour. If you're a white collar uh, worker, that one hour could be worth a thousand dollars or five hundred dollars or two hundred fifty dollars. I mean, if you're billing it out and you're a lawyer and you're on the phone, you're getting eight hundred dollars or four hundred dollars. So it's real money. Yep. To save that hour. Correct. I wonder which ones. I mean, you know, you have to bring this to, with you every time you come to a a new pitch, uh, which is to really come at it with a humility of nobody knows. Nobody knows, but I think <clears throat> one thing that a lot of people miss is what are your frameworks that you use in terms of how you view the world? Yeah. Um, and so I actually think about units of time. Um, oh. I actually just wrote a piece about this It's because it's a big thing for me, um, which is everyone has units of time. If you, if you think about people and like that's their currency, mm. they're either giving it or they're paying with it or they're yeah. using it in some capacity. And if you really boil down parts of it, I'm not saying every company gets into this, but it, it you can boil down that framework into the way in which Companies sell B two B. Yep. Um, you know, someone's going from point A to point B. Um, are you reducing friction? Are you increasing frequency in some capacity? Yeah. Are you entertaining people? Are you like, are you taking away time mm. uh, or giving away time, or are you entertaining their time? There's just so many different parts yeah. of the stack. They always say any business that makes people money or saves them time mm-hmm. has a really good shot. Mm-hmm. So eBay, mm-hmm. it makes you money if you're selling. And also save you time from what it was. If you're looking for the specific Pez dispenser of Darth Vader from 1978, it's going to save you a hell of a lot of time than going to a, a couple of flea markets looking for it. Absolutely. Like you're going to find it immediately. And the buy it now button, yeah. talking about your point about friction, mm-hmm. that saves even more time. I don't want to go through the auction process. Just yeah. give it to me now. Yeah. Time. That's a good one. I'm going to get that blog post from you and retweet it. All right. Listen, we could talk for hours. And in fact, we have. <laughs> Uh, I know you don't do a lot of this, so I just wanted to personally thank you for doing it, number one. And then I also had a sincere personal thank you, which is, you know, I 
I, I always uh, bring my companies to see you uh, down at the Social Capital Partnership when they graduate. Mm -hmm. And not only do you take a lot of time in the meeting, which I know is valuable, speaking of time, but I found out afterwards that you met with six of the seven companies, mm -hmm. and the one you didn't meet with was because they, were, they didn't want to meet. They where they were raising money or something. They I raised think they had already finished raising. Yeah. And then I think one of them um, uh, was uh, alcohol related. Oh, yeah. no, cannabis. Cannabis, correct. Cannabis. Sorry. Yeah, we're not investing in any spirits, but we did yeah. invest in Kush. It was interesting. And I just thought to myself, I need to go talk to this one company that didn't take the meeting. Mm -hmm. Newsflash to any founder. If a great firm wants to meet with you, mm -hmm. build a relationship. Sure. It, how much of what we do is about relationships? I agree significant portion of it is relationships but, but I, then i would have to say maybe then i should have spent more time trying to meet with that company as, oh, as well i know we'll talk about it afterwards all right listen this has been a great episode thank you so much to arjun you can follow him he's arjun s-t-h-i i should just spell the whole thing a-r-j-u-n a-r-j-u-n that's how you do arjun uh and sati s-e it's sethi is how it would uh phonetically be pronounced but it's s-e-t-h-i a r j u n s e t h i. You're pretty active on the Twitter. Active enough. No, active enough. When you have a blog post, you put it there once in a while. And then you have blog.socialcapital.com or something. Uh, Where do you put your blogs? Medium. It's on Medium. On Medium, so you can look them up on Medium. And thank you so much to uh, Netsuite from Oracle for uh, bringing season two of Angel to so many founders and, out there and other investors who are looking to solve the world's biggest problems through entrepreneurship and a key piece of that is giving them the fuel. So early stage investing is critically important to saving the planet. It literally is. When you think about it, I mean, it, so sometimes you like think about the gravity of what we do. Like we sign the checks to mm -hmm. the people who are going to change the world. It yeah. seems inconsequential sometimes like, oh, you're just investing money. But it's like, no, you're not just investing money in like futures of wheat or you're something. And you're investing your money and your time behind those people. Yeah. And you have to think about it in a 30-year horizon. I just had this finless fish on the show on this week in startups, and I was just I'm sitting there going, "How do I not invest in this company?" Mm -hmm. The ocean, and you know this company, they're doing like the mock I've fish. I've heard of them. Yeah. And I had them on the program, and I got an uh, Emmy Award-winning producer, Jackie. Can you make sure that we have a follow-up meeting with them because I need to invest in this company? Um, <laughs> Arsh is like, "Do you just announce that?" <laughs> yeah, I do. I kind of do. I I literally have a video of me asking. Alex from com.com when he was on the podcast, if I could invest and have advisor mm -hmm. shares in the mm -hmm. company. And, this and in the negotiation, did it work out? And I did the negotiation on air with him and it worked out. Yes. And we did a syndicate that's public knowledge. Uh, and that company is one of our great successes that nobody would ever be. Everybody made fun of me. Like literally somebody posted on Quora, is Jason going to lose $378,000, $400,000 investing mm -hmm. in a meditation app? Well, how many companies do you know people made fun of for investing, but it ended up being awesome? <laughs> Almost all. I mean, Slack all was a goof people are like oh a chat room game like irc it was worse game company first yeah moved over into an irc chat group that's stewart's like classic move he's like i'm going to do this incredible virtual game world it didn't work uh what can we do with the last three weeks runway yeah flicker yeah. this he's the master of the save yeah the next time he does a company here's what we should do we should give him 10 million dollars we should light 9 million of it on fire yeah and then say here's a million left go I think it's more like you give him a million dollars or less, <laughs> wait two years, and then just without him even saying it, just give him a note and have it convert yeah, over at whatever price. Exactly. Probably better strategy. Just get, yeah, give him the million dollars, give him the open ended note, and then just say, like, just paint or go on vacation, come back. <laughs> You'll find some inspiration. <laughs> it really does prove the point. Like, it's, it really is about the founder. I mean, he, he's now done it twice where he pivoted into something extraordinary. It mm -hmm. takes a lot of guts to pivot, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. What's your advice when people say they're pivoting? Do you have like some standard advice or stage advice to, I'm, and in his case, that's a, what we call a hard pivot, mm -hmm. going from completely different direction. Yeah. Um, you know, I typically tell people, hey, if you really believe that you can do something here and the market is there, just keep going. Keep going. And uh, the yeah. pivot might end up being just a small little uh, delineation of what you were originally assuming mm. you wanted to do. Yeah. So that's typically what most products, they evolve anyways. Mm. Um, until you feel like you need to give up and you know, you, ne you never really know. I've also seen people, um, just prematurely stop development. Um, huh. and then someone else picks it up and makes it a hundred times better. So 
um, it's it's a it's a hard advice to give. In that case, there was I remember Twitter mm -hmm. had come out, and then Pounce was a. I remember that. You remember Pounce mm -hmm. uh, by Leah? I forgot her last name. And then she went to Y Combinator and did IRC in a box, Slack before Slack. Yeah. And Leah Culver was yeah. her name. I'll give you my own story. I didn't message me. Yeah. And I should have kept going. Because it was it WhatsApp. And it would have been like Telegram today. Telegram today. Yeah. Did you guys have encryption in there or it was? We did. It was part of our roadmap. Um, you know, uh, what's funny is uh, Yahoo bought message me um, the team, but the mm -hmm. assets I owned. And so a lot of it actually uh, moved over to the Telegram guys. Wow. It's amazing. I get that a lot with weblogs. Saying people are like, oh, you sold that too early. I was like, I was broke. I was negative 10,000. I was engaged to Jade and I was negative 10,000 when they bought it. We had 100K in revenue. And they offered $30 million. Yeah. We had $100,000 to date mm -hmm. in Web 2.0. $30 million was a huge acquisition in 2005. It's huge. huge. Flickr went for 25. Yeah, massive. Delicious went for 20. Yeah. We went for 30. And I think Blogger went for 50 or 60. And then eventually that, that equity in. Google became worth a lot more. Yep. But yeah, how do you manage that when to sell when you're talking to founders? Uh, I just tell them you'll know if, you'll know when's the right time to sell or not. Mm -hmm. um, I always just like as being a founder before, um, you know, I I had numerous acquisition offers at higher prices, and I didn't take them because I, again I had hubris and I was like I'm just going to go take over the world. Tree's going to go to the moon. Um, and it didn't work out. So yeah. you're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars lost <sighs> on the table. Um, but that's okay. So, so yeah. that's why you sold early. Yeah. That, that does happen. I, I, the reason I sold early with weblogs Inc, but it was fine because if we had stuck around, we might've been able to grow with three X mm -hmm. where it went in 10 years. So it was fine. But I hadn't been offered $20 million for Silicon Alley reporter and I didn't take it. And I just kicked myself for years that I was an idiot for not taking it. So I did a snap, but you didn't have with message me at that time, the ability to do a secondary with your VCs and have them buy half your shares or a third of them. We did for our series A we did, did and we didn't take it. Oh. Um, and then we also had two acquisition offers above 150 million. Yeah, yeah, we did yeah. not take it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's a hard thing. It's okay. Yeah. You know what? It's one of the things is, you know, living with regret when you're in the greatest industry ever mm -hmm. at the, this incredible moment of time, it's another thing you have to unlearn. Mm -hmm. Like, these kind of mistakes, these all add up to, you know, you're 35 now and 47, like got a lot of life in front of us. A and lot. You can really take those lessons and, and you have plenty of time to, to incorporate them into a win later. Mm -hmm. You know, LeBron lost all those championships and the finals to Dallas, the finals to this team, to that team. I mean, LeBron just poured in the losing early in his career. He got to the finals, got to the playoffs easily, and he just kept losing. Mm hmm Michael Jordan too, but you build up that scar tissue. But the secondary shares makes it so easy to keep going. I had one company that you guys made an offer on for the Series A. Mm -hmm. And I remember you called me and said, why didn't we get the Series A? You didn't call me, but one of the people who worked for you, like, we need some feedback on this. We won't yeah, say the name. I know which one you're talking about. Yeah. And I talked to the founder. I'm like, what's going on? And he's like, we're selling. Yep. And I was like, oh my God, no. And he, he says, you're, you're going to make a million dollars. And I said, that is my nightmare. Mm -hmm. This is 100x from here. The company that's buying you for 30 or $40 million mm -hmm. is going to grow it 10 to 100x from here. Do not sell. Let's set up secondary. Mm -hmm. How much money do you need? Sell half your shares, sell 30 of your shares. Let's get a syndicate together. And they just. Yeah, it's hard, it's hard to foresee. I would never fault oh. a founder for doing it. And I've told multiple founders that if you want to do it, I'm, I'll support you 100%. So I'm the opposite now. It's a hard I thing. fault them for it. Yeah. I'll tell you why I fault them for it. I have now in my later years realized that a lot of times uh, there is this unique opportunity that may not come along. Mm -hmm. And the ability to take the idiot insurance, just get that two, four, six million dollars to buy your loft and you know, sell some portion of your shares. Mm -hmm. It's available now, and it never was when we were coming up as entrepreneurs. I, I you, agree with that. You caught it a little bit, mm -hmm. but before when that happened, we, we didn't catch it for 2007, 2008 timeframe. Yeah, it didn't. Company. It didn't become de rigueur yeah. until 2011, 12. That people yeah. after Facebook did it. Correct. And Zynga did it. It was like, okay, this is legit. That it turned out okay. The founder didn't lose their mind selling mm -hmm. a couple of shares in secondary, which was the fear. Mm -hmm. And uh, when it first, when people first started selling secondary, Fred Wilson, Ron Conway, a bunch of people were like, this is a terrible precedent. Mm -hmm. 
we have to stop this, mm -hmm. uh, I think. And you can look up the blogs, but I think they were kind of really nervous as well because... I, I, think, it was, I think it was almost 90% of people categorically didn't like it. And the reason was, was they were investing at the early stages yeah. and they didn't get to sell mm. during those stages and have their returns. Um, and they considered it unfair. I actually consider it unfair that investors would say that. And I'd, I would say that till death today yeah. is that investors have a portfolio and yeah. founders is just that one company. Right. Um, so if you do want... So their, hypocritical. You want, you want their mind to be in it for the long haul. Um, so the secondary that they do get, you want to make sure... It's not a crazy amount, but it's something that um, allows them to, to live properly. I have a pretty easy rule about this. If it's enough money for them to buy a plane mm -hmm. or even one of those jet suite cards... Or whatever, no. If it's enough to buy a loft or a house in San Francisco, Bay Area, yes. Mm -hmm. So three, four, five million, six million, seven million, okay. But once you get above 20 million, 30 million, now the person starts thinking about a plane. Mm -hmm. They start thinking about the third home. And now all of a sudden you gotta have a home manager and now they're just completely disengaged from the business. They're trying to figure out how to spend that money or not lose it. You don't think like that, right? No, <laughs> I don't, I'm a blue collar kid from Brooklyn. <laughs> Honestly, I really, I think one of the things in life that's very important is remember where you came from mm -hmm. and not get ahead of your skis. The people who are truly happy, and I think Naval mentioned this or he retweeted somebody, people who live well below their means mm -hmm. are so much happier in life. Much happier. I sleep so well not having to worry about second and third and fourth homes like some of my friends or planes mm -hmm. or nonsense. Mm -hmm. Just sleep. Go to sleep. And the hamburger that I ate when I was broke and the hamburger I can eat now when I'm rich it's no different. It's great. It still tastes great. Still great hamburger. And there's no hamburger. But now that... you can just order on Postmates. What? A, I'm not. That's <laughs> ugly. I would never do that. But I, I was explaining this to a mutual friend of ours who was ordering Postmates all the time. I said, do you understand that costs like $15? He's like, no, no, it's all included. I'm like, I think you need to read the receipts. <laughs> You're paying $15 to yeah. get $15 hamburger delivered. Yeah, it's a lot. Be careful. All right, listen, Arjun, thank you for doing this. Thank I was, you for having me. I was, I was trying to wrap up. I'm sorry, I'm your award-winning producer, Jack. I tried to wrap up, and then we got into the pivot and the secondary. So much good information, and that's really why we do these podcasts. If you like the podcast, and if you ever want to reach me, I'm Jason at Calacanis.com, which is my email, first name at last name, and uh, do buy the book. If you, got, if you made it to this point in the podcast, you obviously are a fan of this podcast and uh, what we're doing here. Buy the book so I can write another one. And I want to write the next one, so I'm trying to get the sales there. It's doing well. It's selling. We sold tens, like tens of thousands of copies. This, this book is great. I'm sure it is. I like the, I like the cover. You didn't see the alternate covers. There were two other covers, literally, that I'll release. At some in the next book, I'll release the covers to this one, which led to hilarity at the poker game and everything. <laughs> which was it was a picture of me, as an archangel with a sword, and a spear. Mm -hmm with my chest like chiseled like a romance novel like a scepter flying through the air and like my face photoshopped onto it it looked terrible you should have just a b tested it see which one worked better the problem was it didn't it didn't look good it was like poorly done illustration didn't look <laughs> great but i was like this is so insane that it will get people talking yeah and i didn't do it in some ways i regret it but in other ways i think it's the right move next time next time i will do a shirtless yeah angel archangel uh out there all right we'll see you all next time on angel podcast thank you